Good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, Emerging Drug Trends Among Youth. This webinar is part of a series hosted by St. Clair County Community Mental Health during the month of September, which is National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube channel for future reference. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and add comments you have at any time during this webinar. If time allows, we'll answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Our presenters today are Elise Nichols and Cassidy Livingston. Elise is the Outreach Coordinator at, Saint, at the St. Clair County Health Department in Port Huron, where she works to foster partnerships within the community and help connect residents to needed resources. Throughout her time working in public health, she has educated the community on a variety of topics such as infant safe sleep, teen pregnancy prevention, youth substance use, and COVID-19. Elise holds a master's degree in public health from Grand Valley State University and a bachelor's degree in social, in social relations and policy from Michigan State University. She is a certified health education specialist. Cassidy is a health educator at the St. Clair County Health Department. She graduated from Central Michigan University with a bachelor's degree in public health with a minor in substance abuse prevention and treatment. Cassidy is currently working on her master's degree in administration through Central Michigan University. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Can everybody hear me? Yep, I think we're unmuted. Hi, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. We see everybody in the chat. Um, my name's Elise. I'm the health educator, as Sarah said, um, at the St. Clair County Health Department. Um, my pronouns are she, hers. Um, I'm a white woman wearing a white shirt and have long brown hair. Good morning, and I'm Cassidy Livingston, health educator at the St. Clair County Health Department. My pronouns are also she, hers, and I am a white woman wearing a black shirt with long blonde hair. And so we already saw some um, chat movement, but if you haven't already, could you just let us know if you're a parent, if you're a professional, and um, like what your title is, if you are a professional in your workplace, if you're a teacher, social worker, um, maybe you're a health educator like we are as well. We just wanna get a sense of who is in the crowd. We're seeing come through a lot of professionals, which we expect with the CEUs yeah. available today. Consultant, prevention specialists, um, social workers, parent and a counselor, case manager, therapist. So that's great. We just kind of want to gauge our audience for today and for this morning. Okay. okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, today, we're going to cover a wide variety of topics and specifically some data that is going to be unique to St. Clair County youth. So our goal is that after listening to our presentation today, um, you'll learn a few things. Um, first and foremost, be able to identify the top three drugs used by St. Clair County teens that we're seeing kind of trending today. Additionally, um, define long-term impacts of teen drug use, and we'll also touch on some short-term impacts mm -hmm. and how um, substance use affects teens within our area. And we're also going to touch on some methods of drug delivery. So when we talk about drug delivery, we're talking about how these drugs are administered, how youth are getting access to them. And um, yeah, we're going to touch on a lot, but those are the top three things we, we really want to cover today. All right. Okay, so before we get into um, really data specific um, to drug use, we wanted to go over some demographic data for our county. When we talk about youth population, what are we talking about? What age range are we working with? So for the purpose of this presentation, when we talk about youth, we're really talking about those teens ages 13 to 18. So kind of high school age, um, that's kind of what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, so you can see a breakdown here of data within our county from 2020. Um, so we're looking kind of at the 10 to 14 years range and the, also the 15 to 19 years. And we're looking at kind of the break in, um, you know, between male and female, we're gonna talk about some drugs and um, trends that we're seeing that, you know, may be a little different between the male and female populations. So when we talk about youth, you know, if we add up those two categories, you know, maybe we're talking about 18 to 20,000 
youth that we have seen in our county. So just to give a little breakdown of kind of before we dive into the data, what we're working with. Yeah. And for perspective, for those, I think most people are local here on the call, but for those who aren't, St. Clair County is in um, Michigan. We're considered Metro Detroit area, just kind of north mm -hmm. of Metro, Metro Detroit. Um, and we have a population overall, overall of about 160,000 people. So again, about 20,000 of those meet our criteria for teen or adolescent age. So we'll go to the next slide. So we want some engagement. We're, we're health educators by trade. So we want to hear your feedback. What do you think are the top three drugs that are used by youth in St. Clair County? So we're going to do something called a Zoom bomb. So if you can type in your answer, but don't hit submit, we don't want anybody to be influenced by other people. So type in your top three. And then at, when I say hit submit, and we'll kind of look and see what everybody says. So type in the top three. You can type in one, you can type in three. Whatever you might think. Whatever yeah. you think that teens are using in St. Clair County specifically. Yeah, this is local data. So I think we have enough people hit submit. And we're just going to, well, okay. Okay. We got a lot of marijuana group today. We see marijuana, methamphetamines, benzos, vaping, alcohol, alcohol, Xanax. So prescription drugs, vape, alcohol, marijuana, nicotine. Yeah. Meth. You guys are pretty <laughs> spot on. We're going to dive right into what the top three are. Um, we have a good group with us today. Thank you guys for participating yeah. too. And if you have questions um, as we go through this, feel free to drop them in the chat box and we'll try to address them as we have time. Yeah. So the top um, drug of choice of our local youth is vaping. So in 2022, 17% of St. Clair County teens reported using vapes in the past 30 days. Um, if we look at alcohol specifically in 2022, 12.7% of St. Clair County teens reported drinking alcohol within the past 30 days. And so uh, Cassidy will touch on the survey used to collect that data, but there were some interesting things that came out of that um, alcohol piece. And I just wanna share those with you as well. The average age of alcohol use, again, in our county was, um, or first alcohol use, I, I should say, was 13 years old. 20% of students reported ever being drunk. And the average age of first time being drunk was 14 years old. So again, from the data, it looks like their first introduction on average was at 13 years old. And then it took about a year. Um, and then they had their first experience where they felt drunk. Um, the, the other um, top three drug of choice is marijuana. So again, your comments were spot on. Um, in 2022, 13.5% of St. Clair County teens reported using marijuana within the past 30 days. So as far as the data we have for marijuana, um, it is not as robust as what we have for alcohol, but there's a lot of perception data. And I just wanted to um, include that. 28% of students reported that they thought some of their friends had used marijuana recently. 54%, so over half reported they thought none other friends had used marijuana recently. And this was a troubling statistic. Cassie and I were just talking about this. 43%, so nearly half of students reported it was sort of or very easy to get marijuana. So um, as we've seen the legalization of, of marijuana, um, we're expecting that number to increase. Yeah, we do have a question, at least in the chat, um, about vaping. Are we talking about nicotine vaping only? And I think um, specifically, I think that's where we see the large increase, but you know, we do know that some vapes can contain other substances as well. Yes, as far as the data, um, I believe it includes uh, both uh, THC and then marijuana as well, as long as the delivery source is a vape pen. Yep. Yep. Okay, so digging into kind of looking at the data a little bit differently here. Um, when we're looking at high school students from 2012 to 2022, um, we wanted to note here that in 2012 and 2014, we did not um, collect data. It was not asked on the MIFI survey. Um, and before I get into the data, the MIFI survey stands for the Michigan Profile for Healthy Youth. 
it's an online survey that's conducted um, by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, so MDHHS, and it's really to support local and regional needs assessments. So what they're trying to do is, you know, look at risk behaviors like substance use, violence, physical activity, nutrition, sexual behavior, and emotional health. Um, this survey is specifically for grades 7, 9, and 11. Um, it includes it in, and measures risk along with other school reported data. And the goal of this is that um, it will help schools make data-driven decisions um, to improve prevention in their health programs. We also wanted to note that not all Michigan counties participate in their survey and at that, not every school. Um, so we've seen some, you know, variation in the schools that are reporting data for this survey. Um, but ideally, we like to have every school participate um, so we can see some change. So looking at the percentage of high school students that have vaped within the past 30 days, you can see we're starting at about 20.6% in 2016, increasing um, you know, about 11% in 2018. Um, we saw a decrease almost um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's interesting to know. With almost you know, all of these top three substances, vaping, alcohol, and marijuana, Important to note that although we did see a decrease during COVID-19, we expect that this data will increase um, now that social guidelines have been lifted, people are getting out more, we're seeing more social gatherings, so we expect this data to increase again, these percentages, I should say. So percentage who have drank alcohol in the past 30 days, kind of similar, started out high, saw a little bit of a dip um, continuously from 2012 to 2022. So we're talking about a 10 year span. And then using marijuana started pretty low. I think it increased as it became more, um, I think more widely available, like mm -hmm. Elise talked about, you know, maybe younger kids are getting it from their older friends or at school. Um, so we see a little bit of a dip down during COVID as well. Um, also note that we expect that this is going to increase. Okay, looking at it in a little bit um, more visually appealing way, um, we can see a graph here that shows, you know, especially for vaping, it really peaked up in 2018. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of when it became this new thing that, you know, students and kids were doing and we see a drop. Whereas with alcohol and marijuana, it was a little bit more stagnant, but we do still see a variation of a little rise and kind of a little decrease. So, you know, vaping wasn't even asked, like I mentioned, during those two school years, because I think it was just so, it wasn't so well known. And it was new, yeah. It was kind of a new thing um, that students were learning about. And it's interesting, too, that um, a, quite, you know, a product or um, a drug that we really didn't even see and didn't have information on 10 years ago is now the leading substance used by our youth. I think that's pretty telling as well, that mm -hmm. data. And we have a question, how many kids were doing school at home and were not able to participate in the survey? Yeah. I think that definitely was probably affected with COVID. Yeah. Um, that's where we're seeing some numbers decreasing as well as, you know, the amount of schools and counties that are participating in this data. It is an online survey, um, but that would be interesting to dig into more, Nicole. So thank you for that question. Yep. Okay. So method of substance delivery. So how are our children getting these substances? How are they consuming them? Um, as far as vaping, it's delivered via vape pens. For those of you who don't know, um, there's typically a cartridge and you put it in the vape mm -hmm. and it heats it up and it becomes a vapor. Um, and just, just so we're all on the same page here, vapes are harmful. They have a lot of the same chemicals that you see in traditional cigarettes. Um, it's not just water vapor, as a lot of people say or think. Um, a big company that is a provider of vape, uh, vape pens is Juul, and they make them in various flavors. Again, I'll kind of get into that in a second as far as the flavors. Um, and vapes can contain menthol and or marijuana. Um, vapes can be highly addictive. One vape pod um, is equivalent to 20 cigarettes and nicotine. So again, highly addictive. A couple puffs can be um, 
uh, have high concentrations of nicotine. And I think a lot of kids use them too, because it's not cigarettes, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of a non-traditional way, but they're still getting those chemicals. Yeah. The flavors are appealing. And let's talk about the flavors since you brought that up. Um, so in 2019, refillable cartridge, oh, sorry. And um, a couple of years ago, there were some policy developments. And so just, it's an interesting fact. Juul is really not the hot vape provider that they used to be. It's it's probably Puff Bar now, and that's because of some government regulations. So um, in 2019, some regulations came down from the federal level that said, if you have a refillable, refillable vape, so you have your vape and you put in a different cartridge, those can't have flavors, right? So that um, was Juul's whole business. But there's a loophole here. You can have disposable vapes and they can have and they can have the flavors. So they can have bubble gum, mango is a big one, grape, mint. Mm -hmm. They can ha have all those things that we know kids um, mm -hmm. like. And as far as Juul, they were such a, a power player in the beginning, um, in large part because of their predatory practices. They had the same playbook as uh, old tobacco, we call, um, targeting our young people, trying to get them hooked young so that they had a market for years to come. Yeah, and I think they weren't meeting public health standards and that's really what brought the situation to light. Yeah. Kind of adding on to what you were saying, they were not being honest about when within their marketing and their marketing practices sure. about what ingredients that these kids are actually, you know, anyone, not just youth, but people were ingesting when they were using these products. Yeah. And so there's been a lot of developments between Juul specifically and the FDA and it's kind of constantly changing. Um, and just for the record, as of 2019, the federal minimum age to buy tobacco is 21. So it used to be 18 just a few years ago, now it's 21. Um, and then I just wanna dive a little bit more into the data. Um, in 2022, with our MiFi data that we have, 27% of students reported getting vapor products um, by buying them in a store or gas station. 28% gave someone else money to purchase the vape for them. And then 24% borrowed products from someone else. So that's how our, our youth are getting um, these vape products. And the major company now is a company that has the reusable, um, not the reusable, sorry, the disposable model where you can just throw away after you're done. And that's called Puff Bar. A lot of youth have reported that's kind of the the new hot vape product. Yeah, or you'll see breezes, you know, yeah. I've seen personally around this area, different marketing, you know, three for this price. Yeah. And, you know, youth are able to go into some of these organizations and places where they're sold and get them, yeah. you know, and maybe they're not being ID'd. The ease of access is becoming, I think, a big problem. Yeah. And they're easy to hide, right? They're these little small USB looking things, which we'll get more into, but they're and, easy to hide and keep on you. And they're sweet. They, you know, again, with the flavors too, they can be sweet smelling. Um, so perhaps a parent or somebody in the school system might not notice it as much as a traditional mm -hmm. cigarette smell. So um, vaping number one. Uh, the next one is alcohol. Uh, nearly 40% of St. Clair County teens reported being, being given alcohol by someone else in the past 30 days. And that's how they got it. They were seeking out alcohol and that's how they got it. Um, someone else gave it to them. Again, uh, the alcohol by and large is being consumed by mouth. Um, it's interesting with our MiFi data that Cassidy touched on earlier, we have, they ask a lot of questions when it comes to alcohol. So thankfully we're kind of rich in data when it comes to that. And I'll just read off some more data points we have when it comes to alcohol. 23% of teens reported they got their alcohol by taking it from a family member. And then 12% said they gave someone money to buy them alcohol. Um, just some other facts. Uh, where do teens consume this alcohol? We've heard that a lot. Where are they at home? Are they at a party? Like, Friends. So 49%, so nearly half are, are consuming it at home. And the other half are consuming it at another person's house. We're assuming a friend, but the um, the data doesn't get that specific into who exactly the other person is. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing, it was kind of a troubling statistic that we saw we really wanted to share. 
10% of students rode in a car or other vehicle driven by someone else who had been drinking. So again, again we know we're going to get into some health impacts, um, but we know we don't make the best decisions when we're mm -hmm. under the influence. And so to have 10% of our youth um, getting in a car with somebody who is under the influence is, is quite troubling. Um, and then the last but not least, marijuana. Um, it became legalized here in Michigan in 2018. I think a lot of people have seen the pop-up of dispensaries, um, but it is supposed to be sold to those 21 and older. And the product is often delivered via edibles. You see the gummy uh, graphic we have there, um, brownies. And it can Cookies, also- Cookies, any, anything nowadays you see advertised, you know, yeah. your day-to-day -day foods that you eat it, sure. it can now contain marijuana and substances. And also smoking, but again, with the youth population, we've seen that um, they prefer more the sweet candy type of consistency, and it goes for vapes too. They like those types of flavors. So those are the things that we are seeing. We'll head to the next slide. Okay, so someone I saw in the chat mentioned opioids. Um, so we're going to touch on that right now. So kind of additional drugs of concern aside from the top three we're seeing, I think number four would be prescription drugs. So that's when we're talking about stimulants, depressants, and opioids. The thing with these are they're found at home. They can be taken from a family member and they can be easily accessible. So, you know, pills are ingested. They can also be, you know, snorted, things like that when we're talking about methods of administration. Um, and I also wanted to touch on kind of over-the-counter versus controlled drugs. So I saw a few people in the chat were talking about Xanax when we asked what the top three. So when we talk about substances like that, that are con controlled substances, those are a little harder to get. Um, but once you have them, they can be, you know, navigated and used by youth in your home or a family member. Um, so over the counter, we're talking about medicine that you can go to the pharmacy and obtain, the grocery store, a convenience store, um, some of which have age restrictions. But we also know that some drugs can be purchased over the counter and used still to get high, um, some medications that we see over the counter. Um, so FDA regulations have changed within the last couple of years. When we're looking at how, you know, how are we getting over the counter drugs? I'm sure a lot of you have known that, you know, it's to buy some drugs, you know, even allergy medications, you'll see you have to show your ID for um, that you're 18 or older. So we've seen regulations changed as well. So that's also interesting to know. And, you know, prescription drugs and drugs in general affect everyone differently. So when we talk about teens or, you know, individuals using these drugs, it may not affect you the same way as it does, you know, your friend who, you know, yeah. uses these drugs. You know, Adderall is a big drug that's used among, I think, younger people, um, that's not, you know, that's misused, I'll say. Um, and when we were looking into this, we really realized that, you know, pharmacists are not checking drug registries. Um, so what drug registries are is it's a way for a pharmacist to kind of look at a general person and see what they've been prescribed. Um, and these can kind of be used to track misuse or overprescribing. So maybe, you know, people are not using those to um, their benefit when prescribing drugs. Um, some teens report that they think using these drugs are safer, maybe if they are prescribed to them, but if they're misused, that's actually not the case. It can be very, very dangerous um, and also have short and long-term effects, which are very similar to what we see with these other drugs. Inhalants. So this is one maybe not you know, isn't as out there as the rest, but it's out there. Um, so we're talking about solvents, aerosol sprays, gases, and nitrates. These can also be found at home or in the workplace, at schools, convenience stores, purchased for fairly cheap. So some examples, you know, spray paint, markers like Sharpies, glue, hairspray, a lot of things that you can find in an average home, you yeah. know, it's common. Um, specifically the aerosols that we're talking about. And these can cause brain damage, um, specifically in youth. We know that youth are at an age where it's really crucial for their brain development. So we wanted to note that inhalants, you know, really can cause brain damage. 
Okay, and then we talk about club drugs. You may, you know, hear them referred to as rave drugs, yeah. um, which are known to heighten your sensory perceptions. So some examples of club drugs, you know, Molly, ecstasy, MDMA, meth, ketamine, which that kind of was a new one to me. I hadn't heard about that until recently. But these are also popular due to low cost and convenience. So these are used, you know, we see at raves at you know, music festivals, large gatherings. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing with, I think, all of these drugs that we're talking about, it's important to note that when you, you know, are getting them from someone else, you don't really know what's in them. So, you know, we're seeing teens getting marijuana, getting these drugs that can be laced with something else that can be deadly. Yeah. So it is really concerning because they're convenient, they're low cost, right? You know, you can use them and kind of take your experience, you know, and heighten those sensory perceptions when you're out, you know, and about in gatherings or at, you know, music event. Yeah. And for the club drugs specifically, um, it heightens your awareness, your experience, and makes you feel more connected to other people. So that's where you see mm -hmm. it happen a lot at parties, at festivals, at concerts, that kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to take a quick note here to talk about the prescription the prescription drugs, because I know we've had some comments and questions, and there are a lot of concerns when um, it comes to pre prescription drugs. We, we you know, we, we've tell, told you about some of the concerning data, but there are some really reassuring data points that we have um, as well. So I'll just give you one of those. 77% of students reported using prescription drugs, um, reported that using prescription drugs that are not prescribed to them um, poses a moderate to great risk. So they know that it's not good for them. That is key. Our prevention messages are working. Um, the second point I'd like to make, 96% of students said their parents felt using prescription drugs not prescribed to them is wrong or very wrong. Again, so our parents are doing a good a job. Large here percentage. Huge percentage. So our, our parents are really doing a nice job of imparting on their student the dangers of prescription drugs because again i think there's sometimes that thought of well it must be safe if a doctor mm -hmm. can prescribe it it's not illegal but if if used in a way not directed can be really harmful and the last thing 88 percent of students reported their friends felt using prescription drugs not prescribed to them to be very wrong or wrong a huge percentage mm -hmm. so their peers as well don't um think it's a good idea. So that's really reassuring sharing to hear that they themselves don't think it's a good idea. Their parents are mm -hmm. imparting that wisdom on them and their peers who they might be going out with doing different activities with feel very similarly. So again, some reassuring data here as well. Yeah. And we'll talk about kind of risk taking later in the presentation, but we definitely know when students are in that, you know, risky behavior, they're not thinking of the consequences of their actions. So it's good to see that these these parents and other social supports for these students are kind of letting them know that, hey, you know, that's not okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted, we wanted to break down um, the trending data for these drugs as well. Again, these kind of additional drugs of concern, not ones that fall within our top three. By far, um, our kind of number four place in the county is prescription drugs when it comes to use um, with our youth. And you can see there's been an increase from 2012, so kind of 10 year trending data. And even pre pandemic in 2018, it was 4.7%. And still it stayed there. A lot of the other drugs we've seen a pretty steep decrease mm -hmm. um, because people haven't been able to gather, maybe not been able to get it. Or again, the reporting um, might not have been there, but this has stayed pretty stagnant. And so it makes you. Again, we don't have data to support this, but um, locally, kind of our theory is that people were home, and so they maybe mm -hmm. were getting into medicine cabinets or doing, um, or getting it that way. So that's why that number is still pretty stagnant. It'll over be interesting, the last couple I think, years. too, to see that within the next coming years, what that percentage is looking yeah, like. Yeah, exactly where that number goes. Um, club drugs has stayed pretty steady. Um, even prior to the pandemic, 2018, it was 1.4%. It was pretty low. And again, it stayed there. And we've seen a slight decrease in 2022. Inhalants, um, again, same thing. It's gone down a little bit. Um, and we expected that, again, during the pandemic to, to see a slight decrease. So again, 
this next cycle with the MiFi data um, will be pretty telling to see where we go. Are we going to continue to decrease or are we going to rebound to pre-pandemic levels? Our thought is that we'll probably rebound to the pre-pandemic levels. And I think when we talk about schools participating or choosing not to participate, obviously these numbers could be larger or they could be lower. You know, we, we have to think of that large population or, or those different grades in school that are reporting on this information. So that's important to note too. This is only the reported data that we have. Sure. So plug for the MiFi data. We, <laughs> you know, it's really great information um, that we can get and we can make informed decisions based off of. So we'll move on to the next slide. Again, this is just another visual representation of the trending data. As we see, prescription drugs has, has been pretty high for the last several years comparatively to the club drugs and the inhalants. Um, and we saw kind of a steady off curve from 2018 to 2020. So again, we'll, we'll be tracking that data and watching that um, as time goes on as well. Okay, so now that we know the top three drugs um, and we kind of know some additional drugs that we're seeing specific in our county, which I think it's great that we have this data and we can see, um, we kind of want to talk about, you know, why youth are misusing drugs. So um, various factors contribute to teen drug use and misuse. Um, we can see that first-time use often occurs in a social settings um, with easy accessible substances such as alcohol and cigarettes. Like Elise talked about, we can see that a lot of youth are getting substances, um, maybe more, you know, alcohol, things like that from their family. Um, so we know that it often occurs in a social setting or maybe at their friend's house where it may be, you know, more normal and um, for them to do that. And we also know that continued use might be a result of insecurities or desire for social acceptance. Sometimes you'll hear teens say, you know, well, my friend does it and, you know, he's fine. We hear things like that kind of from young kids and youth. Um, they want to be accepted. They want to fit into that mold. You know, they're growing. They're learning who they are and about themselves. It's a really, really critical stage. So we're seeing that. And, you know, like I talked about risk behaviors, teens, you know, feel indestructible, mm -hmm. you know, they can't do no wrong. They, you know, That's we the time. talk about That's the time that. In their That's life. The time. Yeah. So they're not considering the consequences of their actions and they're taking risks with drugs. Maybe no matter what the drug is, they're taking risks. So we really want to talk about those risks and the short and long-term effects that they are not thinking of in that moment. So when we talk about prevention, we really hope, to, you know, we think prevention is key yeah, to really absolutely. educate these, these young teens and youth. Absolutely. The bedrock of public health is prevention. <laughs> so that's why um, we always um, are passionate about that and really try to get those words out. Um, risk factors. So here are some risk factors that can be associated with somebody um, or for a youth to engage in drug taking behavior. Number one is family history of substance use. That could, is often an indicator that we've seen. Um, mental health or behavioral health condition, such as depression, anxiety, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. So we've seen where, and I think this link has been pretty document, well documented in the literature, um, uh, people who have mental health conditions using substances to lessen their symptoms or to numb deal with pain, numb the pain. Hear. Um, so that is another risk factor and kind of indicator that we've seen. Impulse or risk-taking behavior, again, as Cassie said, when you're young, you can feel indestructible. <laughs> but also as a personality type, there are some teens and adolescents who are more risk-prone or, or more mm -hmm. apt to take those um, risks than others. So that could be a risk factor and indicator. Um, a history of traumatic events, such as experience a car, experiencing a car accident or being a victim of abuse. So this is one we wanted to take a minute to kind of flesh out a little bit. I don't know who, we can even drop it in the chat, but I don't know how many people have heard about ACEs. It's something that locally here in St. Clair County, we have really been honing in on and focusing on um, because it's having repercussions years down the line to our population. So ACEs, 
Yep. There we go. Um, yeah, it's adverse, right, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> adverse childhood experiences. And so um, typically between zero and five, if individuals experience traumatic events, it could be abuse of any kind, sexual, physical, emotional, mm -hmm. a death of a parent, um, maybe having food instability, not feeling loved, not feeling safe. Um, being talked down to. Yeah. If you have um, a high ACEs score, as we call it, um, there's a higher likelihood that in adulthood, you have adverse health outcomes. You have some bad health outcomes. And also, we've also seen addiction be linked to those ACEs as well. So we wanted to bring that up because I don't think a lot of people realize how important those formative years are mm -hmm. um, in your adulthood. And those are incredibly important. Um, and the last thing is low self-esteem or feelings of self of social rejection. So that might be a reason why people engage again, especially at that age, you want to fit in. Mm -hmm. And if there's, even if you perceive that other people are doing it as far as drug taking behavior, um, that might be a motivation to do it as well. Yeah. And I think to expand on ACEs, some of you are seeing the chats that, um, you work with individuals who their ACEs scores, you know, is key to function. So we talk about, you know, likelihood of risk factors in adulthood. It's things that I think most people don't think of. Asthma is a big one, chronic pain, uh, mental health concerns, things like that. So we know that what happens in your young years and your youth kind of shapes your adulthood. So Absolutely. taking those precautions and um, steps is very critical. Yeah. to adulthood and to have a healthy lifestyle where you're not prone to these. Um, the ACEs is, I think, a 10 question yeah. um, survey that you, you can find it online. Um, and the number of times you select yes, that you've experienced one of those things. Um, we see that there's a pattern of, you know, if, if you experience four or more, three or more, you're more likely prone to certain conditions yeah. or certain likelihoods of um, adverse outcomes. And I'll just say this here. Um, I know we have some people outside of the county, but locally we have MSU Extension who does those trainings. Um, so if you're interested, we can drop that in the chat or connect you as well because they are doing some great work when it comes to ACEs. Yeah, and we've done our local community health needs assessment where the data shows um, the impact of ACEs. And then yeah. you can find that on our website too, if you're interested in more of that information. And our website is scchealth.co. Okay. And we'll move on to this next question. Another Zoom bomb. Another Zoom bomb. <laughs> Again, write it in the chat, but don't hit submit just yet. We don't want other people to be influenced um, by, by others and their answers. So what do you think are some effects of use substance use? And it could be anything. It could be health, social, whatever. Long, short-term effects. Exactly. So think about it. It could be multiple things. And we'll give you just a couple seconds to type that in. And then we'll all hit submit at the same time. These are called Zoom bombs, by the way. We didn't make this up. <laughs> this is something we've seen in other trainings as well. All right, so hit submit. Okay, failing grades, poor school performance, developmental issues, addiction, stress. A lot of brain development. Yeah, you guys are group. spot on. We have a spot smart on. group. <laughs> poor performance, social emotional delays. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, gateway to long term addiction. Absolutely. Peer to peer acceptance. Mm -hmm. You guys are hitting yeah. on it. Yeah, there's a lot of health, peer and, pressure, yeah, impulses. reaction times, suicide. Yeah, there are a lot of physical health impacts um, to use substance use, and there's also a lot of social. And I don't think we oftentimes talk about the social implications mm -hmm. as much as we should. So we're going to dive into that in a second. But let's first, we have a video. Let's see if I can play this. Um, Some of the short term and long cool. stop share. I need to stop. Stop share. Okay, so we're just going to share a different screen <laughs> here. Oops. Okay. 
you think after two years, I'd be better at this, but <laughs> two years um, of virtual meetings and we're still trying to figure out a screen share. <laughs> okay. I think we got it. And then if someone could let us know in the chat, if you can hear it, that would be great. Okay. We're going to play the video now. Thanks everybody. And long-term effects that can, can happen from using vapes. So the thing about vaping is that we really don't have a lot of data on the effects. We know that it's harmful and we know this because a couple of years ago, we had a whole kind of string of what were called vaping related illnesses. So people who were having lung damage and were in some cases needing to be put on ventilators. And so we know that the vaping and the vaping was the one thing that they had in common. So we know that vaping is unhealthy. And we also know just kind of logically that the lungs are intended to breathe only one thing, and that's clean air. Our lungs really are not intended to inhale particles, substances of any kind, um, it's with the rare exception of certain prescription medications, which have been studied and have a lot of data to support their safety. Vaping is something that is fairly new, and so we're sort of learning as we go. We know that because most vaping um, involves nicotine, we can say for sure that the effects of nicotine can have very harmful effects on the body. We know that it affects the circulatory system, raises blood pressure, it constricts the blood vessels, it makes them tighten up. And so that makes the heart beat faster and stronger to try to pump blood through these really narrow blood vessels. And that puts a lot of strain on the heart. We know that nicotine also um, affects the flow of oxygen to the brain. And when nicotine is being used, especially by adolescents, we know that it can have long-term and even permanent changes in the structure of the brain, part, in part the part that involves like decision-making and impulse control. Alcohol in general is what we call a central nervous system depressant which that means that it acts as kind of a, um, it, it kind of mutes or dulls the action of the brain and of the nervous system. So in the short term, you have effects like a slowing down of your reflexes, your reaction time. It also affects your ability to make decisions and think clearly, which is why, um, you know, impulses can be greatly affected by alcohol use. Even a small amount of alcohol can affect your ability to make rational decisions. You might do things while under the influence that you wouldn't do if you were sober. Over time, because the body has to process and metabolize and filter out that alcohol, the body sees the alcohol as sort of a toxin. And so the liver is the main organ that's involved in, in filtering alcohol out. And permanent damage can occur when there's a repeated use of alcohol. So there's a condition called alcoholic fatty liver disease, and there's another condition called cirrhosis of the liver. And that's actually a scarring, there's scar tissue that builds up around the liver. That's permanent and irreversible. Alcohol can also contribute to um, the different levels of certain nutrients in the body. And probably one of the most dangerous parts of alcohol use is that the body becomes dependent on it. In the short term, marijuana causes a kind of euphoric feeling for many people. It clouds their uh, sensory perception which is something that many people don't realize is happening during a high, a marijuana high. They don't realize that their sense of time, their sense of spatial awareness is affected because some of their other senses can appear to be heightened. In the long term, marijuana can affect not only the body physically, but it affects the mind and the mental health. We know that long-term use of marijuana is associated with a decrease in motivation in the uh, work sort of um, attention span, especially when it's used by younger people whose brain is still in that development phase. And it can cause people to feel um, depressed even long-term. So it has 
in some ways a very negative effect on their mental health. If it's smoked, it has a lot of the same effects as cigarettes. It can cause inflammation and damage to the lungs, to the lining of the mouth and throat. And um, it can even in long term cause problems with um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, which is something usually we, we think of with cigarettes and even cancer. Okay. So I think I'm going to have to stop my share and then go back in to the presentation. Cassidy, maybe you can help me out here. <laughs> As Cassidy's doing this, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean? Okay. Open the keynote. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> we'll get this. Over here. having us open it up again. That's okay, as long as we can play it, we <laughs> are game. All right. right, we'll just run through. And I'll just say, I failed to mention who that person was. She's one of our fantastic nurses. This is Cassandra Alexander. She's one of our school nurses at Yale uh, Public Schools. And um, I think it's about a year ago now, her and I had a conversation, um, we had a coalition, uh, formerly had a coalition here at the health department called Speak that focused on um, youth substance use prevention. It's now moved over to a separate work group um, and we're still a part of it. But we did this video series, so I cut together some of the, um, the content, as you can kind of see. And we, she talked about marijuana, alcohol, and vaping health impacts. Um, so if you want to see those videos in full, they're on our St. Clair County Health Department YouTube channel. But I know we've had also had some questions about what's happening here locally to, for, to push this prevention message and to address these issues. We do have a local work group. Uh, it's, the, it's a long name, it's SUD, so Substance Use Disorder, Treatment, Recovery, and Prevention. Treatment, Recovery? Prevention, Treatment, Recovery. Okay. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, and that's out of our CSCB, our coordinating body. And so there are a lot of different people from a lot of agencies represented, represented on there and doing that work to not only help, help people who currently are facing addiction in recovery, but also get that prevention message out there. So the work here locally is happening. And I just love local, you know, highlighting local people like our nurse, Cassandra. Okay, so kind of expanding from that video, talking about some health effects. We kind of touched on this, but... We really know that substance use affects the growth and development of teens, especially brain development. That's a crucial stage for them. Um, it occur, you know, substance use occurs more frequently with other risky behaviors, um, such as unprotected sex and dangerous driving. And Cassandra touched on this, but you know, adult health problems, which we've been kind of preaching <laughs> during this presentation, but heart disease, high blood pressure, and sleep disorders. Um, I think a lot of teens don't think about that when they go to use a substance about how it really can affect a long term. Um, so we wanted to touch on that too. So yeah. Um, and, yeah. And to connect that, remember just a couple slides ago, we said that 10% of students reported getting in a vehicle with somebody who was under the influence. Um, and so even if, you know, when we think of health impacts, we think of, okay, this is causing me a cough, or this is making my eyes turn red, or this is making me feel sick, mm -hmm. but also the risky behaviors associated with it um, that can cause other things, car accidents, unplanned pregnancies, mm -hmm. STIs, all of those things too can be a result of drug use and impaired judgment. Okay. And then social effects. So kind of touched on this as well, but negative impacts on family and friend relationships. Maybe um, a youth that's using a substance starts to disengage 
Um, they're not going to family events. They're disengaging from their friend relationships, maybe because, you know, they're aggregating with other individuals and youth that are using the same substances as them. Um, social problems, maybe, you know, fighting or lack of participation in youth activities. You know, maybe a teen that's very engaged in extracurricular activities um, starts to disengage um, and not participating in things um, to go use substances in that place. Um, and then we talk about legal problems, um, arrest for driving or, you know, physically hurting someone while high or drunk. Um, and even, you know, with the legalization of some of these substances with that older age, um, you know, we don't want youth getting in the car with someone that's older. Um, it can have very detrimental effects to their health and overall well-being. Um, yeah, so and, a lot of legal problems. <laughs> and the happen. interesting thing too about the social impacts, and we had a great speaker here come locally, and I know she's been all around, but I I know she had uh, been driving. This was an individual who's, who goes kind of on the road and, and is a speaker, but she um, killed somebody while driving drunk. And again, it's not about the health impacts anymore for her, like, this, you know, the physical impacts. She has to live with those ramifications for the rest of her life and that guilt. And this is one of the ways she's, you know, kind mm -hmm. of giving back is talking to students about that. But carrying that with you, again, these other impacts of drug use can be really profound and lifelong. Right. And youth are at that age, right? They're going through driver's training, um, they're driving with their parents, they're getting their license. It's a critical stage and we want to make sure that they're they're making the right choices. Yeah. Okay, warning signs of substance use. So things to look for either as a parent or as a professional working with youth. First thing would be physical signs, fatigue, repeated health complaints, um, red or glazed eyes, a lasting cough. Again, with the red and glazed eye, you can see that with multiple drugs, marijuana, um, alcohol, we can see with the club drugs as well. Um, lasting cough, again, anything that's inhaled, which can be several substances that we touched on today. We all hear popcorn lung, you know, someone that's been vaping and their lungs are so, you yeah. know, stressed um, from these substances that their cough almost sounds like a popcorn lung. Yeah. Um, Emotional is another uh, warning signs uh, or sign component. So personality change, sudden mood changes, irritability, irresponsible behavior, low self-esteem, poor judgment, depression, general lack of interest. Um, the next point is family. So starting arguments, breaking rules or withdrawing from the family unit. Um, school, decreased interest, negative attitudes and drop in grades. They might not just be showing up to school, being absent a lot, and there may be discipline issues associated with that, um, either with, with the school seeing the products and taking it away or um, their behavior because of the substances yeah, they're using. Coming to school under the influence. Yeah. You know? And then the last is social problems. So maybe they're interacting with new friends who are less interested in standard home and uh, school activities others that may have um, problems or they might have problems with the law change to less conventional styles and dress and music. One thing that Cassie and I <laughs> talked about is of course, when someone's in, um, in their teen years, they're gonna be changing. That's just a fact of life. They're probably gonna be moody. They're probably not gonna wanna go to school all the time. They're probably gonna change their style of dress and music taste. That's natural and that's gonna happen, but Again, as a parent or as a professional working with a student, you know them, you're going to get to know them mm -hmm. pretty well. And if there is just something off, you know it, you know it. So just start that conversation and see what's going on. It may be substance use, it may be something else, but um, something we always say, we get those comments a lot. Well, those are pretty typical signs mm -hmm. of somebody going through you know, puberty or going through their adolescent um, time in life. Yes, but when you spend enough time with somebody, you can really pick up on those changes pretty well. Yeah. You can address them as a, an adult in their life. We know too, there's um, specific clothing maybe, or, mm. you know, items you'll see in the household that are going to be used to hide substances. When we talk about sweatshirts, you know, there's pockets in them, um, different things like that, 
um, that are out there on the market for people to purchase and hide substances in. So that that's a whole nother conversation, but yeah. something to look for as well when we talk about changes of, you know, in duress and things like that. Yeah, they might be, it might be a sign of them trying to hide that substance mm -hmm. and kind of be incognito with them. Good point. And we're going to talk about that. I guess we can just use this as a quick plug. <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks. Um, and I think we're the last presentation of this summit. And we're going to be talking about how to talk to your kids about drugs. So mm -hmm. stay tuned for that one in a couple of weeks. It'll be less data heavy. It'll be more, um, uh, more interactive and um, we'll have a lot of good information there too. Prevention strategies. So know your teen's activities, pay attention to their whereabouts. Um, again, adult supervised activities are always ideal. If it's an after school activity, such as a sporting event, or maybe it's um, student council or student government, those things where you know there's supervision happening is always a plus. Um, the second uh, prevention strategy is establish rules and consequences. So the important piece to this is before there's even any temptation for them to maybe engage in drug use, have that conversation and let them know if you come home drunk or high, or if you do this or that, this is what's going to happen. So for example, if you come home drunk, then you the consequence will be you can't use the car for a month, or you're going to be grounded for a month. And if they do that, then stay true to your word and make sure that consequence is mm -hmm. followed through on. Okay. That's incredibly important. And we have some data on this. Again, this is a data presentation. Um, but 78% of students in the 2022 MyFi survey said parents or other adults in their family have talked to them at some point um, about why they, or about what they expected them to do or not to do when it comes to alcohol or other drug use. So that's a pretty high number. And we were very encouraged to see that those conversations are happening here locally. So kudos to you parents <laughs> who are on the call um, or at least somebody in your family who's having there that discussion. Case managers, counselors, yeah. who all play a crucial role. Yes. Um, third point is know your teen's friends. If your teen's friends use drugs, again, your teen might feel um, pressure to experiment too. Again, we have another data point on here. 68% of students reported having at least one best friend who made a commitment to stay drug-free during the past year. Again, another heartening data point that um, a lot of our youth have somebody in their peer group who they, may, they can maybe rely on to not engage in drugs if there are is a situation where they may be introduced. So it's a great data point to see. We'd like to see it go higher and higher mm -hmm. as we see more cycles. Um, come out with new survey data. Um, fourth thing, and Cassidy touched on this earlier, but keep track of prescription drugs. Take an inventory of all prescription and over-the-counter medications in your home. So again, if you had a surgery or something and you're, you didn't use up your prescription, um, there are drop boxes all around St. Clair County you can take them to. And then here at the health department, we have drug deactivation kits. So um, you can just mix it with that solution, your prescriptions with that solutions and throw them away and it deactivates the active ingredients in there. Um, provide support, let them know that you're there no matter what, even if they do trip up, um, if there are situations that they might encounter, you're there no matter what to provide support and you're rooting for them. And then last but not least, set a good example. If you drink, do so in moderation, use prescription drugs as directed and don't use illicit drugs. Again, they're always watching from the, the 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 womb, pretty much, probably from the beginning of their life. They're always watching their parents, guardians, um, authoritative authoritative figures in their life. So um, set that example because um, they're probably going to oftentimes they'll model model your behavior as well. Okay. So it looks like we have oh maybe one minute for questions. I'll let Sarah come on and. Tell us. All right. So you guys have done a great job of kind of answering as you went along here. We did have one just pop into the chat just a second ago, and it is any harm reduction education given to teens. Not all teens may agree to be drug free. You guys want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So we have um, 
it's not exclusively addressed towards teens, but we have um, an SSP, a, a syringe service program. So we know that not everybody is going to um, live 100% drug free. And so if people do decide to engage in drug behavior, there are things they can do to lessen their risk, specifically of um, in, like bloodborne pathogens such as hepatitis. So we have a program here where we can exchange needles and give folks free needles if that's how they're, um, mm -hmm. they're taking their drugs is through needles, but we know there are other things. We have a great teen health center where we have nurses in the schools who also do education um, as well. I think uh, harm reduction is a, a component of that curriculum, but again, prevention is key. Never, never using it is key. And that's the message a lot of our nurses and we preach to here in the health department as well um, on our main campus. So I know we're kind of at the end of our time, but we had one more pop in that I did want to read out to you guys. And it's how can we encourage schools to get involved in my five survey questionnaire opportunities? That's a fantastic question. Contact your um, superintendent, your principal, and let them know that um, you would encourage them. And maybe there's a group of parents of you who would like to have that survey done. Um, it's up to the school district. It's offered through the state of Michigan. Every, the state of Michigan sends it to all the schools and it's up to the school district to opt in or out. Again, as a health department, we strongly recommend it because we get this really good data we can make decisions based off of this data, but again, you have to talk to your school administrators to get that um, to get that done. All right. Well, thank you both so much for your time and your information today, and to everyone for attending our session. Just to recap, today's presentation is one of many webinars scheduled throughout the month of September, and you can still register for any upcoming presentations at sccmh.org, including the one that. Um, we've talked about here, the how to talk to your teens about drugs. So you can register for that as well. Thanks again for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye.